Welcome uh, to this uh, session this afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Thorsten Kleino, and I'm working with um, Andrew um, and with Jay on this um, research. And uh, I just want to talk about one specific aspect of it. And um, I didn't come up with a better title, so I just called it mortality and deprivation. You know, it's um, maybe uh, quite fitting. Um, but what I actually want to talk about is really only about deprivation as measured by the um, index of multiple deprivation, and then I leave it to Jay and uh, to, to Andrew later on to talk a bit more about the different um, um, areas of deprivation and how they have an impact on mortality. So to start off with a, um, uh, with a picture very similar to what um, Andrew has shown um, earlier, so what we find here are the um, uh, the mortality rates or the death rates. So we just take the number of deaths and divide by the population size, and then take a put put the, the death rate on a log scale. So that's why you have these kind of strange numbers on the y-axis. There, it's all on a log scale. This is for ages um, from 40 to to 89. So it's a 50-year um, age range. And um, the the 10 different graphs that we see here correspond to the 10. Um, deprivation deciles, so measured by the index of multiple deprivation. Um, Andrew has um, said a few words about it. I will come back to it later on and give you more details. But what is interesting here is that we have um, uh, these 10 groups, G1 to uh, G10, we call them here. So starting from the uh, most deprived 10% of the population to the least deprived 10% in the population. And of course, these groups were not formed with a view towards mortality or mortality modeling or anything like that. These groups were formed by the ONS as a general way of describing differences in the deprivation level uh, in, in the population of England. Nothing to do with mortality. But when we look at the mortality data which are available for those groups, then we find that there's an almost perfect ordering. Yeah? So the least deprived, they have the, the lowest mortality, the most deprived have the highest mortality. Now that's what we all know, but what we also find is that, so to say, with the 10% D size, they are almost perfectly ordered yeah? for all ages. The, the differences um, then disappear at high ages. So once um, an individual has lived to the age of 89, it hardly matters. Um, and what deprivation desires, uh, to what deprivation desire this individual belongs. But of course, uh, chances uh, of living to the age of 89 are much higher um, for the least deprived compared um, to the most deprived. So at high ages, there's a, the, the differences disappear. Um, but at the lower ages, so even up to an age of uh, 60 or 70, there are very um, uh, significant differences. So at the age of 60, there is maybe a difference on this scale of around 1.5. So that's on a logarithmic scale that gives us a factor of e to the power of 1.5. Yeah, that's about four, four and a half. Um, so the, the rates in the most deprived areas are about four times higher than they are in the least deprived areas. This is what that tells us. Okay, so there, there, there are massive differences. Looking at each of the these sides in isolation, you would probably be happy to model a linear function, uh, uh, maybe something with a bit of a quadratic curvature there, but, but a linear function would fit well probably to each of those curves in isolation. So for those of you who uh, remember the Gompertz model, that would be the Gompertz line um, uh, that we could fit there, and um, that would probably be a, a reasonable model. Okay. So um, this, of course, here is for males. Um, here's the same picture for females. Um, Roughly the same picture. Yeah, the, the whole cur all curves have uh, moved down a bit. Of course, uh, women live longer, uh, longer sorry, than uh, uh, men, and uh, therefore mortality rates are lower. But the differences are still very significant. Again, the differences um, get less with um, age. Okay. So what happens over time? Andrew has uh, mentioned a, a few um, uh, has. Uh, has given a few comments about uh, what happens over time. So here we now we pick a specific age. Yeah. So we have here um, age uh, 65, and we have again these 10 deprivation groups, um, these 10 socioeconomic groups, and we look at the mortality rates over time. Unfortunately, we don't have many years uh, that we can look at. It's only from 2001 onwards, so that goes up to 2017 here. 
And what we find again is this clear ordering, yeah? almost perfect ordering in any year. Um, and uh, this is uh, for males. Um, for females, it looks um, very similar. But what we also find is not just that there are these big differences in mortality rates, but we also find that there is a difference in the slope of those lines. And what the slope gives us is the improvement rate. Yeah? So the, the average change here is the, what we would call the improvement rate, because that's again on a log scale. And what we see is that for the most deprived, the improvement rates are almost zero. And uh, for the least deprived, the improvements look pretty good. For, for females here up to maybe around 2012, 2013, for males in this picture, I would say improvements also for the least deprived seem to stop in 2011. So what we find is that for the least deprived, for those who are best off, um, the uh, uh, um, improvements were stronger historically than for the most deprived. But since about 2011, maybe 2012 or so, even for the least deprived, improvements are very, very low, if uh, existence at all. Yeah. Um, so what we, we see are these, these big differences. So we would argue when we look at uh, models for mortality in England, and if we look at models to, that we then use to project mortality in England, we should maybe take those um, differences um, into account. Okay? Just as a, a small comment, um, of course, we could look at other groups as well, and um, there, there is, uh, for example, the group of um, members of the USS Pension Fund, so that would include Andrew and, and myself, the USS, of course, the Pension Fund for, for um, uh, academics, and uh, for those, the rate would be even lower than this. Yeah? So we would, um, uh, that's, that's good news for us, of course, and we can all speculate of why academics tend to live longer than others, but um, it's, it's certainly so that even when you look at, at, at when you zoom in further, so to say, on the characteristics of a population like people belonging to a certain pension fund, you get even um, um, different results. Okay, but here, these 10 groups, this is what we want to look at. Okay, so here again uh, for females. So this is our model. We do a bit of uh, statistics um, uh, today. So our general assumption is that the number of deaths uh, follows a Poisson distribution. And in that um, Poisson distribution, there are two parameters which are in there. Um, one is the um, force of mortality, M, and the other one is the exposure. Okay, so the exposure just being the, the mid-year population estimate. We just make a head count of how many people live in the middle of the year in, 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 in a specific um, decile. Of course, uh, the, the, this model would imply that the expected number of deaths that we would find is exactly m times e, and therefore the force of mortality is often estimated as the number of deaths divided by the exposure. Okay. We can have a long discussion about whether the Poisson assumption is correct or not, but we assume it for most of our work, and we will base our estimates then on maximum likelihood estimates for, for that um, uh, model. Yeah? So the, um, the aims uh, uh, today are therefore to look at different models for M. Yeah? So we will not change the Poisson assumption. We have E we consider as a given, that's the, the, the population estimates. But what we want to look at are different models for the force of mortality M, depending on three things, on age, on the uh, calendar here, and also on the socioeconomic group, which we will denote by and when we look at the models for M, one specific question we have in mind is uh, which parameters in the modeling of M we have to choose um, uh, group specific and which parameters can we choose to be common to all groups. So we are particularly interested in what characteristics are group specific, what distinguishes one group from another. And what we are trying to find is, is, is a set of parameter which distinguishes all the different groups, but we want that set to be relatively small. Yeah? So we want to have just a few parameters which describe well the differences between the groups. Um, okay, now a few more words about the IMD itself. So um, this uh, uh, is just a reminder basically of what Andrew said earlier. It's an index which was formed to measure deprivation, not to measure mortality at all. Okay, it has nothing to do with mortality. Um, 
Income and employment are the two areas of deprivation which are most important for this index. They contribute um, each 22.5%. Um, and then there are other areas in there which uh, contribute less, education and health in particular. And then, of course, there are the other three which, which you can read there. Now, Andrew mentioned earlier that, of course, the inclusion of health in any model that predicts mortality is maybe not ideal. But when we take the IMD data, then there's no way that we can take health out because we don't calculate the index of multiple deprivation or self. We take the index data from the ONS and they calculate it in the way they calculate it. So what we then did in the next step is um, to look at individual components of the IMD, and this is what um, Jay and, and Andrew will talk about um, later. Okay? So for now, we just take the IMD data um, as given. The index um, is calculated for these um, LSOAs, for the lower layer super um, output areas, um, roughly 33,000 in England. Each gets a number, and then they are ranked. So we have the 33,000 ranked areas, we cut them into um, uh, 10 uh, equal slices, and each of those is a decile. And for each of those decile, we then uh, take the, uh, 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 look at the mortality data. So here's a map, um, maybe um, you will uh, roughly find yourself in one of those areas where you live, don't know. Um, yeah, so the, the little island there, of course, is London, uh, zoomed in. And uh, this is a map that's produced by the, uh, that was produced by the uh, ONS um, um, for the index. Okay, so that's again nothing to do with mortality so far as index. So what we now look at is we take the um, exposure data and discounts by gender, by age, by calendar year, and for each. Um, of uh, those 10 D sites. Yeah? So the 33,000 areas have been split into 10 groups. For each group now, for each of the groups, we take the um, mortality data. We have the mortality data available from 2001 to 2017. That's certainly the last um, uh, data set that we used here. And uh, the ranking is done in 2015, and that ranking also doesn't change. Yeah, Andrew has um, uh, mentioned it before. Of course, some LSOAs might, so to say, move up in the ranking. Some might move down. But also what's important here is to remember that people also move. So even so, we have the areas identified as an LSOA. There might be people moving out of this area, and other people might be moving into this area. That's also something that, that could happen and which we cannot control. Okay, so there are lots of uh, small issues with those data sets. Yeah, so this is the uh, well-known fact, of course. So the, the, the richer you are, the better educated you are, the bigger your house is, yeah, the... the posher the school maybe where, where your children go. Um, all of that helps you to live longer yeah, for, for whatever reason. And uh, we, are not, uh, we will not uh, investigate the reasons here. We will just try to model it um, statistically. Yeah. Also, we, here I've spoken mainly about mortality rates. This, also, of course, translates into life expectancy. How it translates into life expectancy, we have um, looked at in, in, a, in a relatively small study in, in, uh, which was published in the actuary uh, uh, in April, so maybe some of you have seen that, um, where we look at the differences in life expectancy. So, statistics. Um, this is our basic model. It's a model which um, uh, has been developed now about uh, 15 years ago or 16 years ago. Um, has been um, published by Renshaw and Haberman. The original Renshaw and Haberman model also contained the cohort effect, which we have removed um, for, for this part of the um, uh, presentation. The model was developed um, not as a model for multiple population, not as a model for 10 groups, but rather just as a model for one group of people, say that the whole of England and Wales male population or female population, but just one population. So what you will find here is that we will model the log mortality rate. Yeah, the, the M is again the force of mortality here. And we model it as a uh, sum of three components. We have an alpha xi. The alpha xi is our basic underlying age structure. It's specific to each group i, 
So it's a, it's a, the alpha is, uh, has an index i here, so it's specific to the socioeconomic group i and just models the, the basic age structure, yeah? so mortality as a function of age. And then we have the first term, uh, beta 1, um, kappa 1. Again, beta and kappa, they both depend on i. So they are, again, specific to each um, of these um, d cells, of the 10 d cells. Um, the kappa is something like a mortality index. Kappa depends on t, so it measures you know, what happens in year t. It's the effect, the first period effect, as we call it. It measures what happens in, in, in year t, in calendar year t. Um, and then beta, um, so to say, uh, rescales kappa to a specific age. Yeah, so the kappa ti, of course, is the same for all ages x. Yeah? There's no x in there. So we multiply with a beta x, and that uh, rescales um, um, things to specific ages. The changes in kappa are something like the improvements. In particular, the changes in kappa 1 are something like the improvement rates that we would observe. Um, but they are different for the different ages. That's why the beta factor is there. So the beta is a, as an age effect, but it rescales the period effect. And the second beta and kappa, they are then, so to say, second order effects, which um, are, are very useful to improve the fit of a model, but which have less of an interpretation than the first uh, uh, beta and kappa have. So this is a general model. All parameters that we have in here are group specific. All of the parameters have an eye, yeah? so they, they're all uh, group specific. So this model uh, is expected to fit very well. Also, it's a model with loads of parameters, yeah, with, with many, many parameters. And now what we're trying to do is we try to simplify the model. Yeah. We um, simplify the model by choosing some of these parameters to be common to all groups. That's um, uh, one of our main uh, um, research questions, so to say, uh, which of those parameters will really uh, identify the differences between groups? Is it the alpha, is it beta, is it kappa? Okay. And then compare these models in terms of fit. Um, but we will also try to replace some of the parameters, beta x, for example, with a, a, a deterministic given model for beta x, rather than having just a non-parametric estimate for the beta x's. Okay. So those are the, the, the questions um, that we have, or the, the different uh, models, the different nested models that we look at. And uh, here's, some, for example, the, the, uh, the common period effects. And that, of course, is the well-known and rather famous model by Lee and Lee from 2005. This is now a model which is used, um, for example, by the Dutch actuarial profession for their mortality projections. They use the Lee and Lee model. Um, the assumption of Lee and Lee is that if the kappa 1 is common to all groups, that there is one common trend that drives everything, that drives all the ages uh, mortality, but also all the socioeconomic groups uh, uh, mortality. When the Dutch apply it to project the Dutch mortality rates, they don't apply it to socioeconomic groups, they apply it to um, mortality rates in different European countries, um, which um, it's a good idea. So we investigate whether this is a good model or not. And then finally, we have also added some cohort effects, but I'm not going to talk about that part uh, today. So here they are. OK, so these are the 12 models. The model number one is uh, right at the top there. That, of course, is the Renshaw and Haberman model. And then all the others, the difference is certainly up to model M6. The differences to model one are just that some of the parameters are have no index i. Okay, so it's a bit of an, uh, an eyesight test maybe for the people in the back of the room, but uh, you, you, there's for some of, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you can't spot it, you know, just the, the eyes disappear. <laughs> so the, uh, it's a spot the difference competition, yes, yeah, okay. But the, of course, it's, it's relevant because if, say, model M6, for example, okay, this will be the model which turns out to be the, our preferred model. And model M6, the alpha doesn't have an I and neither have the betas. So what we find is that it is these age effects, when we fit the, the data, uh, sorry, when we fit the model to the data, then the age effects, the differences in the age effects between the groups are not important. Okay. Or in other words, all groups have a similar age structure independently of their socioeconomic status 
people seem to respond to age similarly, in terms of mortality rate, they respond to age similarly, okay? Of course, we know that the mortality for the, the most deprived is much higher than for the least deprived. So these differences must, to, you know, they must be seen somewhere in the model, say in model M6, and they will, of course, be seen in the cuppers then, yeah? because they are, we find, must be. The cuppers must be group-specific. And that reflects the fact that there were these different improvement rates. So a statistical model that captures the 10 groups must take care of the different improvement rates that we have seen in the 10 groups. Okay. So again, those are the models um, with, uh, starting with M7 and uh, then going down to M12. Those models are, of course, all having some kind of, of given parametric structures for the betas. Yeah, we set our beta 1 equal to a constant to 1, and we set our beta 2 equal to um, just a linear function of h. Okay. And uh, we, we are testing this assumption as well. Right at the bottom, of course, um, uh, is then the, the, the CPD model. That's the model here, M12, which has the fewest number of parameters among all of those. And M1 is the model with the most parameters. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, as a little exercise, we could calculate the number of parameters in M1. Um, uh, yeah, the alphas alone, if we have the ages from 40 to 89, we have, of course, 50 ages. We have 10 groups. So alpha alone is, has 500, is, is 500 values. Yeah, the alpha xi is the number of ages types the groups 500. The same for beta 1, the same for beta 2. That's 1,500 plus the kappas, yeah, 17 years times 10 groups, 170 times 2, 340, 1,840, I think. 1,840 parameters, yeah. So a lot of parameters, yeah, a lot of parameters. And you want to bring this down because it, 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 it doesn't make sense to overfit those, those data, yeah. So there's, there's no point in that. We want to concentrate on models which have fewer parameters. So here's a bit of a structure of those. Of course, the, the models starting with M7, they um, are all these models with the parametric terms for beta 1 and beta 2. They are, of course, part uh, or, or nested. They're not part of, but they are nested in M5, where M5 is the model that has the common betas. Yeah, so M5 is the model which, with where ev almost everything is common. The two betas are common. And then in M6, all age effects um, are common, alpha and the two betas. OK. Um, oh yeah, this, these are just some uh, technical comments here, so just in case uh, anybody wants to um, join us or, or repeat this analysis or try with your own data, um, everything here is based on maximum likelihood estimation based on the Poisson assumption for the number of deaths. So we just take the models that you have just seen and put it in there for, um, or the mu should be an M, I'm, my apologies for that, put it in there for the force of mortality um, and then maximize the likelihood function with respect to alpha, or with respect to beta, and with respect to kappa, and so on. Okay? All of these models have some identifiability issues. Yeah, just here, say, if in model M1, right at the top, if I multiply all betas by 2 and at the same time divide all kappas by 2, I get the same fitted mortality rate. So I cannot statistically distinguish between any set of parameters where I have a beta and kappa, and then another set of parameters where I multiply all betas with two and divide all kappas by two. Yeah, that there's no way of distinguishing between those, and uh, therefore there are what we call identifiability constraints. They're very common in, in, in mortality modeling. Almost all stochastic models have these issues, and we need to just uh, impose some constraints on the parameters which help us to identify then one set of parameters and to, to, to as, as unique, yeah, that's, that's the point of it. Yeah, but we don't restrict the likelihood in that way. Yeah? We don't restrict the model. We just identify one um, set of parameters. For the quantitative analysis, we would then use a Bayesian information criterion to compare the models. Yeah, that's the, the, the advantage is that this is just one number. Yeah? So we just, each model gets one number. The model with, in this case, the lowest number is the winner. That's the, that's the idea, um, because we want a model which has a relatively high value of the likelihood. So the term 2 times log L should be big, 
as big as possible. Um, but at the same time, the model should have as few parameters as possible, so the term k times log n should be as small as possible. So we try to minimize k times logarithm of n yeah, by, by, by minimizing the, the number k there, the, the, the degrees of freedom as we call it here, or the number of parameters roughly speaking. But at the same time, we also want to maximize L. So we take the difference between these two and whichever model turns out to have the smallest BIC, this is for us the winner, so to say, right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit simplified, but the BIC, of course, is a very well-known statistical quantity that is uh, well-established and, and used a lot. Okay. So the smaller the BIC, the better is the model. So here's our first result, um, which clearly shows M6 is the winner. Yeah, so that's a, uh, is, is the good news. Um, we have a, a winner here, and the, I just picked out um, three of the models which I want to uh, look at in particular. Okay. So we have for females and males, um, in, in both cases, M6 has the smallest BIC value, the smallest log likelihood value, uh, um, sorry, the largest log likelihood value, so the best fit in a sense, has of course model M1, but that's also the model that has the most parameter, everything else is nested in there, yeah? so that has the, the best value of the, the log likelihood, with everything being group specific and therefore loads and loads and loads of parameters. M6 then, on the other hand, has a lot fewer parameters. Yeah, so the alpha, the beta, and the two betas being not group specific removes 450 parameters from alpha, 450 from beta, and another 450 from beta 2. And uh, so therefore, the, 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 the worsening of the likelihood function is more than compensated by the reduction in the number of parameters, and therefore the BIC of M6 is a lot better. Um, M8 is also here um, uh, shown again. Um, it turns out to be the best model for, the, for males um, among the models M7 to M12, okay, but not for females. Nevertheless, we think that M8, so to say, has a, has a, has a certain is a rather attractive model. First of all, the, the model presented by Richard Platt some years ago. Um, uh, was a great um, extension of the, 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 the cairns blake doubt model um, by having this kind of non-parametric age effect added to it, alpha x, and uh, therefore we looked at it in a bit more detail. And also, as I said, for males, this turns out to be the, the, the best model among those that have kind of uh, a constant beta 1 and the linear beta 2. And now I want to, so we know what models we need to look at, and we now just look a bit at the different, um, the different parameter estimates that we get, concentrating on alpha, beta 1, and kappa 1, rather than the beta 2, kappa 2 terms, and then also look at the quality of the fit, and then some uh, uh, comments about projections, okay? And then you can have coffee, right? So the, we, we start with um, the model M1 here, and uh, of course we have uh, here um, alpha. So that's the basic underlying age structure. If we were to model mortality among those uh, 10 groups without looking at trends in time, we would just look at alpha. Yeah? So if there was no time trend, yeah, no changes in, uh, over time, then we would just look at alpha. So a kind of a static model. And this is um, so the, the, the uh, uh, parameter that we first look at. This is here for the female population. And there are, of course, clear differences. The alpha clearly picks up the differences between the groups. The alpha also picks up this feature of, of the data that the uh, mortality rates at high ages converge, as that there is no difference anymore in the mortality rates once we get to an age of 90 or so, or very little differences. Okay. Now, for M5 and for M6, so those are the models where now the beta is common. Yeah, the beta parameters, the rescaling of the P8 effect is not um, group specific anymore. That's the same for uh, independently of deprivation. And uh, we're looking here at the alphas, and the alphas look pretty similar for model M5 to what we have seen in M1. Okay? But then M6, of course, just has one alpha. There are not 10 alpha curves anymore for M6, it's just one, and it lies right in the middle there. 
And so, so far, there's not really a surprise. This is what we would expect to see. Yeah, this is exactly what we would see, like to see. M7 and M8, again, the alphas are very similar. Uh, for M8, the common alpha right in the middle of all the others, that's where it should be. And uh, there's, again, no surprise. They all pick up the general shape of mortality as a function of age. Now, the, um, the, the betas, okay, so those are the other age effects. This is our model M1. The betas, as I said earlier, they are, we have 10 curves here for the 10 different groups. The betas are telling us how strong the improvements in mortality are for the different ages. So the higher the beta is here, as long as kappa goes down, the better is the improvement at that age. And what we see, there's maybe a bit of structure here. Yeah? So like the, the uh, improvement certainly at a very high age is being lower than at age, say, 70 or so. Um, but there is not, I would say, a clear difference between the different D sites. So that's an indication that the beta can maybe be um, chosen as common. Okay? So now if we all look at the picture, yeah, and uh, the colors change slightly or the, slide, the, the style changes. So the, the betas that we see here are still in this picture, but just as dotted lines. Okay? So the dotted lines in this picture, again, the, the 10 betas that we have just seen for model um, M1. But now we look at model M5 where the betas are common, and this is the black line here. So the beta one is just, just one black line which lies right in the middle. So there's no surprise here, it's a good thing. Yeah? We, we, the, the, the beta one that we estimate is right in the middle of all these group specific betas where it should be. Okay. If however we go to model M6 then, our best performing model, then we see a clear difference. Yeah? So there's other curves that kind of does, doesn't lie in the middle of all the dotted lines. That's the uh, uh, beta for um, M6, and that looks very different. So the common alpha, yeah, the, the, if we make the alpha the same for all deprivation levels, then that has an effect on all the other parameters in the model, in particular on beta, and the beta looks a bit strange. Okay? But nevertheless, we get a common beta. Okay? We have, of course, no betas for M7 and M8, because the beta 1 is just a constant, is 1 in, in those models. What happens over time? Now, in M1, we can, uh, I said earlier, we have a, a number of constraints that we can play with yeah, without changing the fit of the model. And here we have chosen our constraints such that all the, the temporal, the, the period effects, the temporal factors, they all start at zero. They all start in the same point. So what we now find is that we cannot really just, you know, put much emphasis or in interpretation on the, on the level of these lines, but what we can see is that, again, for the least deprived, the gray line there right at the bottom, the improvements are the best. So if we look, were to look at an age-independent mortality index over time, and we start them all in the same point, then what we see is that mortality goes down the most um, in, in the least deprived area. So that's the gray line right at the bottom, and uh, mortality reduces the least in uh, the most deprived areas. These are the two top lines there. Uh, uh, the, that's the, the, the first and second decile in the IMD data. Okay. That's very clearly to be seen here, and this is not something which is specific to a certain age, as we have seen right at the start of this talk, where we only looked at age 65. This is now kappa 1. So these improvements or these uh, indices, those period effects, they are now rescaled with beta xi or then later on with uh, a common beta. Yeah, if we look at here model M5 with a common beta. Okay. But they are also still starting in, in zero. Okay. And we see these clear differences in improvements. We also clearly see that for the most deprived, there wasn't much of an improvement over the last, uh, say, seven years or so. Right, now again, what happens if we move on to M6? Now, M6 now has a common alpha parameter. M6 also has a common beta x1 and a beta x2. So somewhere the differences between the socioeconomic groups must appear in these parameters and where it appears uh, 
for a Model M6 is, of course, in the cuppers. That's the only thing that's left, which is group-specific, which depends on the deprivation. And uh, there we see it. Yeah. So the cuppers, there's no way that we could somehow apply some constraints to bring the cuppers back together or so. We can multiply the cuppers with the constant, and everything that would be negative moves up towards zero, and everything that's above zero moves down to closer towards zero, or, or both move away. But what we cannot do is let them all start in the same point. That's just not possible. So the cuppers are now, in this model, the cuppers are responsible for picking up the differences between the different groups. And there's no way that we could choose them to be common or something like that as an, as an early and lean model. But what we also see, again, is that the trends change over time. Yeah? So in particular, for the most deprived, the line right at the top there, there's a downward trend, and then it levels off. And also, right at the bottom, the least deprived, there's a stronger downward trend in the first few years, but then also it gets weaker um, over time. So we see this feature again and again. There's no way around it. What we also find very nicely here is this very strict ordering. Yeah? Again, the, the groups have been formed with respect to deprivation, nothing to do with mortality. But when we look at the mortality data for those groups, there is a very clear and precise ordering of those D sides. Yeah. So every 10% you move up in the social and the, yeah, the food chain and the hacking order, your, your, your mortality goes down by, by a certain amount. Yeah, this, is, this is almost like a law of nature. Um, Okay, for the M7s and so the kappas um, look different, they're different rescaled, but again the slopes, if you look at those very closely, the, the slopes again are, are identifying what group uh, uh, we're talking about. Yeah. And then in M8, yeah, alpha again is common. Every time alpha becomes common, we have this, this structure uh, in, in, in the kappas. Yeah, the kappas pick up the differences between the different um, the different uh, 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 socioeconomic groups. Okay. Right. Now, so those are the parameters. As I say, we're not going to look at these second order parameters. They are all looking a bit wild. I just have one picture later on um, of for those. Um, what I now want to just briefly show you is a bit about the fit of the data. So again, some statistics. Yeah, I'm, I'm a lecturer after all. Um, the the uh, the. The number of deaths that uh, we take here minus the expected number of deaths. And the expected number of deaths, of course, is driven by the models that we use. So a different model gives us a different expected number of deaths. We take the difference between what is observed, DXTI, and E of DXTI, the expectation. Yeah. We take that difference, and then we normalize by dividing with the standard deviation of the uh, fitted uh, uh, death counts. And, uh, Assuming that we have a Poisson model, the expectation is just uh, E times M, and so is the variance, and that's where we get this, the, the, the Pearson residuals and the forms that we have them. Okay. So what we would want to see if we now plot those residuals is that there is no structure. Uh, if there was some structure left in the residuals, and that would tell us that the model does not pick up all the structure. It doesn't sort of say cover everything. There's still something left in the residuals. So here are the residuals for model M6. Yeah, this is our winner, okay, the, the best model. And so what we are looking at here is group one. So I, the index I is equal to one. We are looking at the group of the most deprived 10% in England and Wales. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have um, our years, and on the y-axis, we have ages, okay? So for every combination of x and t, we look at whether the residual is positive or uh, whether it's negative, okay? And I think the light colors represent positive residuals and the black are negative, uh, or the other way around, okay? <laughs> um, so, but what we see is there's no structure. Yeah, so there's no structure. I would argue that this is what, uh, uh, yeah, I would say this is a random pattern. And that's what we want to see. Yeah, it's roughly the same number of light uh, squares and, and black squares. So we have residuals which look pretty much IID as we want them to look. Okay. Now, 
different groups, same model. This is only for group one. Okay, there could still be pattern in other groups. So this is group five, same comments, random residuals. That's good. Yeah, and the same for group ten. Okay, and now we do the same for model eight. Okay, so this was the other model. This was the model which also has a common alpha, but then beta is equal to one here. Yeah, the coefficient in front of kappa one is just one. And then the coefficient in front of kappa two is just a linear function x. And what we here find when we look at group one is that there is some structure. Okay, the structure is not along the time axis. The structure is along the age <coughs> axis. We find large residuals for small ages, large positive or positive residuals for small ages, ages 40 and 50, and then um, uh, uh, again, positive residuals for ages 80 plus and in between negative. So what's missing here clearly is some kind of quadratic curve um, in the age direction. Okay, that's the, the bit that's, that we pick up here. So clearly we wouldn't be happy with those residuals and therefore we are not maybe so happy with model M8. Okay, if we look at uh, group five, it actually looks pretty good, M8, but when we then look at the least deprived, we find again this structure, this time in the opposite direction. Yeah, so there's maybe the, uh, another H kind of quadratic curve going this way, along the H direction. So what's missing here is another term, which is X square, something like with X square in it. Yeah, that would maybe help to improve that model. So again, this is clear evidence that M6 is, uh, uh, is kind of our winner. Okay, and now finally looking at the fit of the, the data. So here we have um, as a function of age, um, we have the observed mortality in the year 2017 for females on the, on the left. This is the pictures that we've seen right at the start of this talk or one of those pictures. And then the other two are the fitted rates using models um, M6 and M8, and uh, there's, we can hardly spot the difference. Yeah? M8 is just ever so slightly more um, uh, smoother, okay? Just a bit smoother. Right, and, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, if we look over time, again, we have these two models, just get a, bit of water. Um, on the left, of course, it's the empirical data, again, at age uh, 65. And on the right, uh, on, or in the middle and on the right, we have the two fitted curves as, as mortality curves as functions of time now for a specific age um, from the two models. Again, there are hardly any differences. So as far as the fitting is concerned, even so the residuals for M8 look worse than they look for M6, those differences are so small that if you just look at the fitted curves, there's hardly any differences between these two models. Yeah? So that's why we still think that M8 is a good contender, but M6 is just ever so slightly better. And now we come maybe to the, 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 the open research bit, okay? And that's the projection. Projecting those time series, is, of course, is quite difficult because what we need to project are the kappa processes. If we look, say, at model M6 here, our winner, okay, there it is. It's the alpha x plus beta x1 times kappa plus beta 2 and so on. If we want to project mortality to the year, say, 2020 first and then maybe 2030 and 2050, of course, using those models, what we need to project is kappa 1 and kappa 2. Those are the only two terms which depend on time. Uh, so there's no change in the alphas, no change in the betas, because these are functions of age. But what we need want to project into the future is kappa 1 and kappa 2. Okay? So what we looked at is, well, first of all, kappa 1. That's the driving period effect. That is the thing that drives improvements in mortality. And if we look at the different improvement rates here for kappa 1, not for uh, mortality at a certain age or so, but this is the mortality index, so to say, we see that the improvement rates for the different D sites are very different. Okay? They are kind of about twice as high um, for the, 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 the least deprived than they are for the most deprived. Okay? So projecting these um, 
processes will be, will be difficult. Yeah, on the left, we have the kappa 1 and, um, and the model M6, and on the right, we now have kappa 2. So kappa 2, maybe we can do something with it, okay? Um, but the kappa 1 has to be projected um, into the future. The same here for M5. When we look at M5, the kappa 2 on the right-hand side is maybe relatively easy to project. We could maybe even say we take a common kappa 2 or so to reduce the number of parameters further and then have something stationary, some kind of mean reversion thing that um, projects kappa 2. But what we do with the processes on the left, I'm really not sure about because these have uh, uh, not just, there are not just differences in the mortality rates, as we see here, okay, but there are also very different improvement rates. And I think the main question is, so the main problem with projecting those 10 time series that we have there, the, the kappa one projections, um, the main problem I think is that we need to make an assumption about what happens to the, um, to the improvement rates of the 10 D sires. So is it going to be such that the gap is getting wider and wider, so the improvements for the least deprived will always be uh, higher than the improvements in the mortality for the most deprived? Or is it so that the gap somehow stays constant or it gets, uh, it gets maybe even closer? I don't, I don't know, maybe it, the gap closes, I, I, I don't know. Okay. So here is really some room uh, where statistical analysis on its own will not provide an answer. There will need to be some assumptions being made, some what um, is often called expert judgment, uh, judgment uh, will be required to, to answer this question because we cannot just rely on 17 years of data to project those time series. Okay. So to wind it all up, um, uh, each effects are common in those 10 D sites. Um, I think that's uh, the, the conclusions that we can draw here. Yeah? All the models which have common age effects, they, they perform really well. There's maybe a question about the alpha, but, but even that. Yeah? So our model M6. Um, however, the period effects, they are very different. So to assume that the driving period effect, as it is the case in the Lee and Lee model, that this is common to all 10 socioeconomic groups in England, I think that would be wrong. That is just not the case. The, the, the different uh, improvement rates across the 10 groups, they make that um, assumption, um, I would say, uh, wrong. Yeah, just wrong. Um, so the, um, the cuppers, they should not be chosen to be common, but the alpha should be. But of course, as I said earlier, the big challenge is uh, what assumptions we make about the kappa processes to be able to project mortality into the future. Yeah. But what I would also say is that, I hope which maybe becomes clear from this talk, is that if you only look at one population in isolation and you project that, you might easily get something wrong, okay? It's, it's because the, the, you know, if we were to look only at the least deprived here, we wouldn't notice that the most deprived have this really low trend and would maybe just think that the least deprived, that the trend for them will continue forever. I'm not convinced of that. So I think to look at different populations, that makes perfect sense. But the challenge is then, as it says here at the last point, is to make reasonable assumptions about um, what will, what will happen to the differences in, in, in mortality rates, okay? And with that, I finish. So I hope, uh, of course, uh, that you do have some questions uh, which I'm happy to answer and, uh, or that you maybe have some suggestions on what to assume, um, uh, what kind of assumptions to make to, to, to enable us to project those 10 time series. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Torsten. So we have a, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I think we should certainly take a few minutes for questions now. And there will be a roving microphone. So if you have a question, or perhaps you have a, an observation or a view on these differing trends in the, the different groups. So uh, someone here first, and then someone up at the, uh, more at the back. Thank you for the interesting results. It's, uh, just as taking a step back, I was wondering in terms of the data risk there. So say 
IMD probably changed the, how they actually decide the IMD desire over time, how that has been taken into account. And second question is, how do we actually interpret this result for our insured population? Just looking at the most affluent group, it looks like they haven't experienced a slowdown in recent years. Then how does it, how does it actually, should we actually use that information for the, for actually use it for the insured population? Do you want to go first? <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe um, I say something about the, the, the second question first, and then Andrew maybe knows more about the data issues. Um, so how would it affect the, the insured population? Now, I think it is clearly so that much of the risk is uh, for insurers or for annuity providers is concentrated in the least deprived groups. Yeah, maybe in the, in the least deprived 10% or 20%, those people are more likely to have um, annuities, more likely to have um, um, very big annuities maybe, and uh, more likely maybe to have all sorts of other insurances. We have seen a, a slowdown there. There's no question about it. The, the least deprived, um, which I think will include many of the people in this room today, um, the, the experience of slowdown in mortality improvements. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think the way to, to project it and then also to use those projections and pricing is, of course, to take into account all sorts of risk, all sorts of uncertainties about the uncertainty about the, the, the forecast of mortality, but also to take into account maybe the, the research I think that Andrew's talking later today, uh, uh, looking at causes of mortality. I think that might also help there. Yeah. But it is very clear for me that the, the slowdown in mortality affects everyone, um, but it, it does affect uh, the, the least deprived to a, to, to, to a less extent. Yeah. So if you to, to assume that it's over with mortality improvements, that, that would be wrong. Yeah. I mean, there are still improvements there, but they are just very slow, very low. Yeah. Um, the, the other point in terms of changes over time in terms of deciles, I mean, it's, it's not something that we, we have yet looked at, but we, we're now starting to look at uh, how the individual constituents of the deciles are, have changed over time. So I think that's slightly an open <coughs> question, although the, the separate issue then is, well, how, how do you model that in you know, if you're looking at a particular, say, an insured population? Um, although and I think from the, uh, the, there was a table that I put up in the earlier uh, presentation where the... Uh, we had a table of uh, how things had changed from the 2015 to the 2019 deciles, and mostly the people, the areas stay in the, in the same place. Uh, so the, uh, my thinking there is that the, the differences, you know, there would be some differences in terms of what we've seen here in terms of the deciles, but I don't think the, I think the general picture would be very much the same that the, uh, uh, the uh, the, the sort of least deprived would have been improving at a faster rate than the, uh, the, the most deprived. Yeah. So there's a question up there. Hello, yeah, I, I thank you for the presentations. They've been really interesting so far. I really, um, I got, I think I've got two questions or observations, and I think it's probably one for each. Um, the first point is that one of the most common ways that have been used recently by uh, mortality and uh, longevity experts in displaying socio-economic differences in mortality are these tube station maps that show different life expectancies at different tube stations. Um, now, I'm not quite certain how those are constructed, but I guess they must use some element of um, uh, mortality rates and therefore life expectancies based on quite small areas around mm. each uh, around each tube station, whether that's a, a London tube station or the underground stations in Glasgow or whatever. Um, given the information that you portrayed about the sparseness of the data um, for both the exposed to risk and even more so for the number of deaths in the smaller areas and how you got around that by adding together ages and adding together years, um, even, even by adding together quite a lot of ages and adding together um, all the years for which data may be available, um, you might be hard pushed to come up with good estimates for the small areas. Um, how much credence do you actually give to these um, tube, tube line maps of mortality? And, um, uh, you know, is there, uh, I mean, you're, you know, anything else you care to add to that? And then, a, there's um, a good answer to that, and that's in the, uh, a later session. So, okay, I'll so, wait. So you don't uh, look at these 
areas in isolation. Yeah. What in, you do in which, is you look at other areas that have similar socioeconomic characteristics and do a bit of averaging there. Okay. So that you bulk up the data by looking at neighbours. Okay, in which case I do feel that I'm entitled to the, the second point. Yes. <laughs> the second point was um, thinking about the well-observed or, or the, the widely observed and very widely commented on decline in the rates of longevity improvements that we've seen over the, um, uh, the last nine years or so uh, in the United Kingdom and indeed in some other countries, uh, some other developed countries, but not all. Um, the research that uh, the, the Torsten was showing seemed to very definitely confirm that the fastest, uh, the, 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 the most significant slowdowns were in the worst, uh, were in the kind of, sorry, the, not the worst, the, the, the lowest, the most deprived socioeconomic groups, um, and that the, 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 the least deprived socioeconomic groups were still so, showing some improvement, albeit not perhaps as fast as in previous decades. Um, have you considered doing any work which might, I, I mean, your, your work of the dividing into the 10 different deciles uses this kind of overall index of deprivation. I just wondered whether there was, it, it may be so substantial a piece of work that it wouldn't be worth it, but I just wondered whether you might find other ways of dividing up the population by another composite index, but with different weightings or bringing in some factors that weren't used or taking out other factors that might th th shed even more light on which particular factors had had the biggest impact on slowing down on um, mortality and longevity improvements. Uh, very good observations. And, and again, we'll be looking at these points, but perhaps later on. So we will be for example, looking at alternatives to the uh, uh, index of multiple deprivation in particular, and then separately, cause of death will be also a, a sort of investigating that question. So I'm not sure there's a sort of a, the, the right answer. It's, it's all a very complex uh, sort of picture generally, but uh, we're certainly trying to do exactly that, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, just a, a question about um, the divergent um, period effects. I don't know, is there a way of looking further back in time to see whether uh, the trend has always been divergent or has it, um, if you like, come in and out? Uh, that may be from different data sets. Um, and, and the second question is more around getting your views on the fact that most pr practitioner act actuaries are actually using a, an all-population projection um, to bolt onto data, or bolt onto a mortality table, which is actually representing the mortality of, say, the upper three deciles or the second decile, and how much of an error is there in not sort of projecting the the trend that we would expect for the for the for these deciles? Yeah, um, the the uh, the data that we have for the IMD index, you know, that that goes only back to two thousand one. Um, but you're absolutely right. We could, of course, um, uh, look at other data sets and try to find something that maybe divides the population into two socioeconomic groups by, by other criteria. We haven't done that. So I cannot answer your, your first question of whether this is a trend which has started many years ago or whether it has started in 2001. Um, what we um, do find is that the trend changes in 2000, around 2010, 11, I would say the trend changes. Um, but we, we cannot go back any further at, at the moment with the data that we have. Um, to answer your second question, I think uh, for, uh, in particular for an annuity provider to, to look at uh, uh, to base projections on the whole population is, uh, I think, would, would be rather risky for the reasons I've mentioned earlier, that there's a, there's a I would say, a, a big chance that most of these annuities will be in the least deprived uh, these sites. Maybe not in the least deprived 10%, but maybe in the least deprived 20 or 30%. And they not just, these people not just experience a lower mortality, 
they also experienced higher improvement rates. And uh, therefore, even if you adjust the level of mortality correctly um, by doing some adjustment, whatever it is, um, you might not in, uh, adjust the improvement rates in the same way. So I would always uh, suggest to look at the D size and take them into account. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would maybe just add to that that the, the key thing also is that if you have a, say, uh, as you mentioned, Alan, the, uh, say a, a, an insured population that is more like the least deprived two or three deciles, that uh, what you really have to do is to you know, say, say if you want to model the national mortality, but then you need the gap that's between the two does have some uncertainty, uh, you know, just now, but also in the future. That, so that gap does need to be thought about as uh, something that's stochastic rather than just that it will, that gap is 85% of the national mortality or, or whatever. And, uh, but also <laughs> and with the narrowing mortality at the high ages, it shouldn't be a constant 85%. Hmm. It should be, uh, getting true. closer to 100% yeah, right. at the higher ages and a, a wider gap at younger ages. But that, the size of that gap needs to be also thought about as being stochastic and then probably also that, that at least from now, looking forward, that perhaps that should be a growing gap uh, in the short term and then maybe it might come back in the long run. But as you say, we it's, it's a bit it's uncertain as to what will happen really in the long run. Uh, here. Maybe just one, one question after this one. Maybe everybody's probably gasping for coffee now. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and get my question out despite gasping for coffee. Um, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned relatively early on that the, um, the population is divided up into deciles um, on the basis of uh, IMD scores. The population of England, and I can't remember whether it's age 60 plus or age 60 to 89 or whatever, but the, the sort of a nuitant pensioner population, there is higher weight to the lesser deprived deciles. So, so it isn't 50-50 um, there. And I just wondered whether you'd sort of had any comments on that effect and whether you'd factored that into the work at all yet. Well, we... They will um, talk about individual um, areas of deprivation later on, and um, without spoiling his talk, I maybe can already say that uh, what we call income old, the income of 65 uh, of age at age 65 plus, is, is a very significant uh, um, uh, variable, a very significant covariate that can be used to model um, mortality in a different LSOAs. Yeah, so you're, you, I think that is, is, is how we would take into account that the IMD is not, so to say, a perfect measure. And that uh, the, the, the deprivation at different ages uh, is, is maybe different in the same, in the same LSOA. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we'll try to take that into account in that way yeah, by looking at individual areas. Yeah. I think, was there one more question in the middle? So, yeah. I had one question about the IMD. So it seems that the IMD was taken in 2015 and the data set was 2011 until 17. Mm -hmm. So the most deprived group would have been a combination of neighborhoods that were always deprived and neighborhoods that declined during the study, study period. Likewise, the most affluent areas would have been affluent mm -hmm. either the entire study period or areas that had come up throughout the study period. Could that not have played a role in those slopes? That's right. There is movement between these, uh, an LSOA can be in the top decile in one year and in a lower decile another year and, and so on. So what we are looking at is the ranking in 2015. Yeah, so when, when we say it's uh, the top 10%, it's the top 10% in the year 2015. And we then keep that group fixed and look at the mortality data for that, for those areas. I think as well that the, uh, the so that with the, the, the fixed decile across the whole of the, the sort of 17 year period, so that, that will give you one picture. Now, if you were to just take a slice through the sort of last three or four years that, that as being relevant for the 2015 IMD, if you then used a different IMD, the 2011 for 
some of the middle years, you would have a very slightly different picture from the mm. one that we would see here. We would perhaps see a slightly wider variation because the, on the basis that the IMD 2011 would be a slightly better discriminator, notwithstanding just if, if there's just a bit of noise, perhaps. But uh, yeah. Uh, Oh, yes, that's a, uh, yeah, I think we would need to take that point away. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, yeah, yeah. 